Which of those analysis degrees of freedom is the better one to choose as the analysis uh, degree of freedom and, and therefore the controlling the whole problem? I'll replace the symbols EA over L, which are used for stiffness of a line element, by a single symbol, a lowercase k. So we have a stiffness of the left and the right elements characterized by these symbols. So they fit into the assembly of the stiffness matrix. For mass, I'll use a lower and an uppercase M. And then here I've applied the fixed boundary condition at the left, which gives me the zeros in those two locations. I'm showing what is the true forced response problem, which has no force at the center node, and a reaction at the left node, and a live load at the right. But now, wait, we must do a mental experiment, and that is different from the original problem. First you knock out the inertia terms, and then you conceive of a problem where you only have loads on the analysis degree of freedom. So we're going to first keep uh, the uh, center node as the analysis node. Therefore, in our mental experiment, we only have a load F2. That means we can solve the second equation here, which gives that the outboard displacement is the same as the inboard. And if you think about that, yeah, that makes sense. Statically, for very slow motion, if I stretch this inboard link here and to this point, then the outboard one, if there's only static forces, will just go along for the ride and just moves as a rigid body. Let's do that same mental experiment and find the coordinate transformation if you use the tip coordinate as the analysis or master degree of freedom. And here's this mental experiment with the load now put on uh, the tip degree of freedom. In this case, you would use the first equation to relate the two variables. And this becomes the needed mapping. So now if I compare them side by side, and this was the question, the first question, what are the mappings? Here's the mapping for U2 as the master node, and here's the mapping when U3 is the master. So the question is, which one is the better choice? That's our uh, point here under B. Well, it's really better to choose the outboard degree of freedom, U3, because it brings in the flexibility of that outboard element. Otherwise, it would be just a rigid body mass moving and would probably give you a lower frequency, I would guess. So uh, there's a bit of a conflict in that you're then putting the um, analysis degree of freedom out on a lighter weight or a less mass less massive part of the structure, but in this case you would need to do that in order to get the elasticity of the entire system brought into play. Let's return to that question of the single beam element where we used static condensation to reduce the problem to a single degree of freedom problem. We were looking for free vibration of the uh, beam element, and it's a cantilevered beam configuration. This time, I'm going to start off um, as a separate permutation of what I consider the best of all worlds, that is to use the consistent mass matrix and then to use the tip deflection for the analysis degree of freedom rather than the tip rotation. So this should be the most accurate solution. Uh, when this is done, you can uh, assemble the full set of equations first. The mental experiment that we do starting here uh, allows a live load at the tip in the translational degree of freedom and then no rotational force. And the static equilibrium law allows us to solve for U4 in terms of U3. And here is that relation. 
we see here that the uh, tip translation will give us a tip rotation according to the static law. Uh, the average angle between the tip and the base is uh, U3 over L in radians. The tip deflection here is shown to be three halves steeper than that. And this should be an accurate static solution. This becomes the transformation, the G matrix here. And again, we get the tip deflection mapping directly to the tip deflection. The tip deflection giving us the tip rotation through that path. We go back into the full equation for free vibration. Calculate these um, reduced masses and stiffnesses. And we'll get the um, one by one problem in the next slide. We'll assume harmonic motion and gather the terms. And again, we get a mechanical impedance term here and the displacement, the single component. We solve for that and we get frequency to be a generalized mass or a reduced mass uh, and a reduced stiffness term. The uh, reduced mass here is given, the reduced stiffness, you do the multiplications and it comes out with this result where this constant now is only 0.14% higher than the classical value. So this particular version of uh, Guyenne reduction um, where we use the, um, the best modeling techniques came out to be very accurate. Kind of a nice result. There are four permutations that are possible in this beam problem. Um, those that use consistent mass, those that use lumped mass, um, those versions that use the tip rotation as the analysis degree of freedom, and those that use tip translation as the analysis degree of freedom. Now we've done two of those four cases. Uh, in fact, we've done the worst modeling procedure and the best modeling procedure. I'd like to fill out the uh, permutation of possible problems by doing the other two, and we'll move th through those pretty quickly. If we keep the consistent mass idea and then switch to rotation as a master coordinate, as we did in our first go-around in the lecture, uh, we just change the mass term involved uh, put that into the frequency expression, and we find now that we get an answer that is high. Um, this seems to make more sense in the Rayleigh tradition because we're constraining the kind of motion here by uh, our static law and probably won't get the lowest energy solution. So normally you would get a high answer, and this is a, um, a much higher than the classical natural frequency. The fourth permutation is to use lumped mass and then tip translation. And this is somewhere intermediate in modeling uh, style. Not so good because of the lumped mass. Uh, we change back to the mass component. We use the mapping for the tip translation. Put that into our previous frequency expression. And this time we find we're quite low. So uh, again, the moving outboard of the uh, mass has caused us some trouble and, and it's a modeling error by doing that. Um, translation, however, is a decent uh, tip uh, uh, degree of freedom to use. Let me summarize the results of our four permutations of that simple beam vibration problem using uh, static condensation. Here I have uh, the most accurate at the top with consistent mass and U3 as the master. And that's right on. Now if you use the awkward uh, master coordinate, then you've badly constrained the system in the static uh, displacement sense and you get a much higher answer than you should. 
if you make the modeling uh, approximation of the lumped mass, that's definitely going to move mass out to the tip and slow the system down. When you uh, do the, uh, the better of the analysis degrees of freedom, you have minus 29% here. This is interesting. This is really below the classical value. And lastly, the worst, uh, really the worst modeling of all is to use lump mass and then the awkward pasture coordinate. But you see, it's not the worst answer. And the reason is there's a partial cancellation of effects. The lump mass tends to lower the frequency because it's a uh, awkward mass distribution. But on the other hand, this constraint of the poor choice of analysis coordinate tends to raise the natural frequency. And so giving somewhat of a cancellation of effects there. So. Uh, that's interesting. Really, the poorest of the modeling procedures had some compensation of error and was not the poorest final result. Problem three is an example that shows how the force reduction process occurs in a forced vibration problem where static condensation is used. Let's take a simple beam problem again, vibrating in the xy plane. And it's under the action of vertical uh, tip force and a uh, tip moment, as shown. We're going to use GAN reduction and remove the tip rotation as an omitted degree of freedom, so we only have tip translation as our analysis variable. The physical equation of motion looks as shown here. This would be the F set in Nastran terminology and has already had the single point constraints applied that remove those to uh, other degrees of freedom. As before with static condensation, we'll carry out a mental experiment where there are no loads in the rotational tip degree of freedom, and we write down the static law that results. This gives us a coordinate transformation where the rotation is one-seventh of the translation, and then the mapping to the reduced form re reduces that uh, previously a two vector into a one vector characterized by the component F3 now, which is the final reduced force on the F3 uh, coordinate to be 3.714. So this is a single combined external force in translation that is supposed to have the same effect as both the original physical force and moment did. And that's certainly not intuitive that you could do that, but that is a statically equivalent representation. So it's clear that when you do this modeling, there's um, quite a bit going on in the background. It's rather easy to use static condensation within MSC Nastran and other codes. So the user should be aware of what's going on internally. And I guess that's the purpose of such a course as this.